Oh, hi, my name's Jessica, and welcome to a short story sketch video where you watch a speed painting of a background that I'm working on, while I typically would narrate a short story that I wrote inspired by that painting. However, this time around, we're actually just going to be reading from this really cool book called The Secrets and Mysteries of the Cherokee Little People. I'm just going to be reading uh, a little bit about the Yunwijunsti, which is little people in Cherokee, and uh, just about their legends and what they're about. The Yunwijunsti uh, are very similar to like uh, European uh, fae or fairies. Uh, they are a race of smaller humanoids that like to be mischievous uh, and they have different clans, they have their own communities, they keep to themselves most of the time uh, and have very little interaction with um, people like us. <laughs> so it's really interesting to hear more about just the legends behind them and I wanted to share these with you. So before we get started, I just want you to know that I will be referring to them as Yunvijinsti. Uh, so just for pronunciation purposes, uh, it's spelled Y-U-N-W-I-T-S-U-N-S-D-I. And that's U N V J N S D. Yunvijinsti. Yunvijinsti. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and begin. The Yunwi Junsti are most often seen at dusk or dawn. They like to be with the animals when they feed, gathering the plants with the deer, fishing with the bears, picking up their firewood with the beaver, or visiting the native people escorted by the fox. They've coexisted with the Cherokee people for countless centuries and look like full bloods, dark skin, black eyes with straight black hair that reaches to the ground. They're handsome and strong and no more than three feet tall. They've always dressed as the Cherokee people dress at any given time in their history. They speak in an ancient Cherokee dialect. Some of the elders today can understand this strange dialect and know what they're saying. Some say it's a lati, a Cherokee language that's now extinct. They have their own communities or clans throughout the mountains. Like the Cherokee, each community has its own jokesters and serious people, leaders and followers, troublemakers and thinkers, dreamers, doctors, hunters and gatherers. So there are five clans that the Yunvijunsti are broken up into, and we're just gonna go through those five clans um, I've already read through some of this, so I'm pretty certain I know which clan I would be in uh, if I were a Yunwi Junsti. So after I'm done reading, uh, please tell me which clan you think that you would be in if you were a Yunwi Junsti. Rock Cave Clan The rock caves on the mountainsides are preferred homes for the Rock Cave Yunwi Junsti. They like to help the native people. They do chores for them when they get behind. They bring them medicine plants when they're sick. Watch after their children when they're busy. Just like the Cherokees, they've been pushed into the smaller areas to live. They make themselves less visible because of constant invasion. Sometimes the Yunvijunsti are mischievous, but they're only playing tricks on people to remind them how others should be treated. Their message is this. How one treats others is how he will be treated and remember, whatever you do, you will eventually experience that which is similar. It is important for them to help humans maintain balance and harmony, the cause and effect of living. The Tree Clan. Some communities of Yunvijinsti live among the trees. The old trees like their company and feel more useful when playing hosts to them. Their huge trunks with hollow passageways provide good housing and their large roots act as private entrances. They drop their old limbs to warn the Yunwijunsti when someone is approaching. These Yunwijunsti like to help their nature friends, the winged and four-legged and crawling ones. The snakes are their companions, and together they provide protection for all the others. They are known as being mischievous, but they're only letting humans know when there is a lack of respect for nature, such as failure to respect the homes of others, especially out of carelessness or when it's due to a quest for personal gain. They may cause things to happen to you and have things taken from you, so you will remember Mother Earth provides all that we need for shelter, food, and clothing if we don't take too much or use it wrongly. 
when man takes too much for himself, kills needlessly, or denies nature's right for life, it leaves others without. The Laurel Clan. The community of Yunwijunsti who live among the laurels like to help with plant nourishing. Wherever there is a need or a problem, they are ready to help. Whether it's a large cornfield that provides for an entire tribe or a small garden, they love to nourish the land and plant ensuring good crops. If an area has been burned out, flooded, or hit by a drought, they nourish any plants surviving and help them to recover at the same place if possible. If not, they move plants to a different area to grow. Nothing becomes extinct with the help of these little people. The Yunvijunsti of this group are not encountered very much anymore. As the laurel has been cut away, they go further and further into the undisturbed mountains. They still come to help when the plants are challenged, but the job becomes very difficult as man keeps adding to nature's destruction. They try to discourage man from his own devastation by planting certain warrior plants around everything that he builds when the respect for plant life and value is ignored. The Laurel Yunvijunsti teach us not to take our perceived needs too seriously. They encourage us to be happy with what's provided and share with others. The fourth clan is the Dogwood Clan. A special group of Yunvijunsti live among the dogwood trees. These people are very delicate, both physically and emotionally. They only look for the good and beauty in everyone and in all things. They can be seen only when they choose to reveal themselves with the dogwood blossoms. They spend the rest of their time dreaming of good things for people, animals, plants, those who swim, those who crawl, and those who fly. They care for everything that Mother Earth provides. When they do appear, they look around and their tears become the dogwood blossoms. Some seasons their tears are scant and fall quickly. Other seasons their petals linger and are full. It depends on whether humans are treating each other in all things with consideration, especially our Mother Earth. They are never known to be mischievous. All year they dream of helping each other from sincere and caring hearts rather than for personal gain. And the last clan is the Thunder Beings. According to legend, it took thousands of cycles for the Thunder Beings' wings to mature. Before that, they lived in cocoons on the clouds and fed up on the rains. Some versions of this story say that they could become human beings if they choose to. They could send their spirits down to earth in the forms of bolts of lightning. When a bolt strikes near a woman's womb, the spirit could go inside and grow into a human. They would, however, only grow to maybe three feet tall when an adult. To the Cherokee, they're called the Thunderers, and they bring great power and wisdom to the people of earth. It is said that they do not come as much in these days because the race of destroyers has infested our mother earth global wide. The earth people have become weak from fighting this mind disease. In this era, it is time for the thunder beings to use their power and wisdom only from the wind, rain, and clouds, creating more frequent damaging floods, extreme droughts, and uncommonly forceful winds. Their power and wisdom is used now to protect mother earth rather than the human beings who inhabit her. So we're gonna go ahead and get into a few of the stories about them, and we're just gonna touch really brief on these stories because there are a lot in this book. So um, I'll just read two or three, and uh, then we'll call it good. What's kind of cool is that right before the book, there's like this little poem or saying or quote uh, before each story, and this one really caught my eye. It says, if you do things deliberately to prove that you don't believe in them, like disturb where they might live, or mock their singing and drumming, or even dispute someone who does believe in them, the little people will help you to believe. And I feel like that's just a threat. <laughs> that's totally, that is totally a threat. That's like, they're just like, oh yeah, no, don't worry, we got you. You looking for those keys? Yeah, we got your keys. <laughs> it just made me laugh reading that because... There are a lot of little, like, quirks that the Yunwi Junsti have, and I could just imagine, like, the terror they could unleash on you uh, if they wanted to really poke fun at you. Like, one of the things about them is um, if you are in a forest because you're hiking or hunting or whatever you're doing, uh, and you find a trinket or a hunting knife or something that was clearly man-made or crafted, uh, and it's just on the forest floor someone has dropped it or lost it, 
in order to be able to take that item, you're supposed to say, Yunwi Junsti, I would like to take this. And if there's no response, you're good to take it because you asked and you'll walk away unscathed. Uh, but unfortunately, if you just pick that thing up uh, without asking first or stating your intentions, uh, they will throw rocks at you. Yeah. Yeah, don't turn your back. You're, you're gonna pick that up, turn around, and they are there. A rock will come flying at your head. Don't don't mess with the Yuan Wujunsti. <laughs> On a clear moonlit night, two men were walking down a dirt road. A hard day of work had them tired, and they did not relish the long walk home. After they were passing a cornfield, one said, "You know, if we cut through that field, we'll get home a lot quicker." Well, what are we waiting for? His friend replied. They both turned into the field, each following a row of corn. The road disappeared behind the tall stalks of corn as sharp green leaves sliced at their faces and rubbed at their shirt sleeves. The two men had not walked long before they heard the rustle of corn ahead. They heard the sound of scuffling, quiet laughter, growing louder and closer. Suddenly, out of the darkness, between rows of corn, a party of Yunwi Junsti tromped right through the middle of the cornfield, leaving them speechless. Thirteen in all, they marched noisily along, one or two poking their heads out through the stalks to glance curiously at the men, but otherwise paying them little attention. The two men knew it was a band of Yunwi Junsti that they saw. Many wondered about this since it was believed that the Yunwi Junsti show themselves only to the Cherokee and one of the men were white. Whatever the case, the men watched as the little people left the field, crossed the dirt road, and vanished into the darkness near a mountainside. So this next section is called Never Challenge the Little People, and I just wanted to read a little bit from the intro just to uh, get you in the mood for what exactly these stories are about. <laughs> the elders tell of small voices that can be heard in the woods, voices that sound like people in conversation, or sometimes like whistling or singing. They know how to respect these voices, so when they hear such sounds along the trail, they silently pass with lowered eyes. They know that these voices come from the Yunwi Junsti. Sometimes they would recall a person who mocked the Yunwi Junsti. Once, a man heard them sing and joined in as loud as he could. A bug flew into his mouth and he was coughing and spitting all the way back down the trail. Another person was trying to dance. When his feet got tangled, he fell into the creek. The Yunwi Junsti used spider webs to measure a person's height. If you walk low and backwards into the web, they might come out to investigate. The elders say that if you stop and listen to the voices while in the woods, they'll sometimes come to you. They'll circle all around you with their laughter and singing, their whistling and chanting. You will find them watching you from behind old stumps and rotting logs, peering out from tree branches and piles of leaves. When this happens, they're the only ones who decide when and how you leave. You can't run. I can't? Watch me. Sometimes the little people, Yunvi Junsti, would come near a house at night, and the people inside would hear them talking, but they would not go out. And in the morning, they would find the corn gathered or the field cleared as if a whole force of men had been at work. Once the Yunvi Junsti had been very kind to the people of a certain settlement, helping them at night with their work, taking good care of any lost children, until something happened to offend them, and they made up their minds to leave the neighborhood. Those who were watching at that time saw the whole company of Yunwi Junsti come from a ford in the river and cross over and disappear into the mouth of a large cave on the other side. They were never heard of near the settlement ever again. Thank you so much for listening to my stories and learning more about my culture. I hope you really liked the background that I was painting. I was really proud of it. I painted it a lot quicker than I expected and it was kind of encouraging to see that my timing is getting a lot better because if I want to actually do this professionally, I need to make sure that my time management is good. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. If you would like to hear more about the Yunwi Junsti, uh, there's literally like two thirds of this book that I didn't even touch with more stories and more fun facts. And I could easily involve them in the next speed paint video. So just let me know if that is of interest. Uh, and if not, I thought maybe we could do like some subreddit readings, um, like am I the asshole subreddit or like, you know, relationship subreddit or something like that. I really like 
writing my own short stories, but I just have not had the time to. And I hate that I don't post often on here. I, I really want to. And I found that um, I had painted these back in January. And yeah, it's March now. And I still had never come up with a story about them. And, and normally the story comes first and then I get inspired to do the painting. So I finally just decided like I don't have to write my own story every single time. Um, maybe I could just talk about other people's stories or, you know, like I said, maybe like a subreddit reading because I'm kind of involved in all of those AITA subreddit videos. <laughs> I totally listened to those in my pastime. I think they're really interesting and they're fun to discuss. So um, if you would rather we do that on the next time around, I'm totally fine doing that. Just let me know down in the comments below and thank you so much for watching. Please enjoy your next video. Bye!